And without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce this year's keynote speaker, Gary Nell. Gary Nell got his start in journalism right here at UCLA. As a fellow Bruin, he was the edit editorial director of the school's Daily Bruin during his undergraduate years as a political science student at UCLA. Today, Mr. Nell runs one of the, one of the world's most renowned public radio networks. He is president and CEO of NPR, leading its worldwide media operations, which include partnerships with 900 public radio stations. As such, he oversees fiscal, operational, and journalistic integrity of NPR, and leads the building of the organization and its philanthropic base to support and leverage the strengths of NPR and its extensive network of stations. Before NPR, Mr. Nell was CEO of Sesame Workshop for 12 years. He also serves on various boards and councils, including the Council on Foreign Relations and the Military Child Education Coalition. We are honored to have him with, here with us today and are glad his son Dwight could be here in the audience with us. So please give a warm welcome to Gary Nell. Thank you, Nicole, and good morning, everyone, and happy Father's Day to everyone, Chairman Lewis, and good morning to the distinguished faculty, the guests, especially you parents out there, and of course, the graduates of 2012, congratulations. <laughs> now, you probably know that I used to run Sesame Street, and because of that, one of the last times I was invited here on campus, I got into a big public spat with Cookie Monster. It was giving the Letters and Science commencement address behind us at Pauley Pavilion just a few years back. We started talking about the nation's obesity crisis and the value of eating vegetables versus eating cookies. And as many deeply intellectual debates go, when two parties with strong convictions and passionate perspectives try to find common ground, it went downhill pretty fast. Tempers flared, names were called, cookies and Brussels sprouts were thrown about. But I'm happy to report that Cookie Monster is still eating cookies. <laughs> now Cookie and I have made a shaky peace but with all that drama, I'm just glad to be uh, invited back to campus. I'm now in a new gig at NPR, and I've, I guess I've traded Big Bird for Nina Totenberg. <laughs> and as you may imagine, um, we get into quite different kinds of debates at NPR. You know, but it wasn't, a, it wasn't that long a time ago that I entered, like you, my first day as a freshman here at UCLA. I remember walking through Roy Squad, feeling pretty intimidated, filled with a rush of emotions, hopes and fears, curiosity and optimism, and ambitions for getting out there and for changing the world, but I didn't have a plan about how to do that at all. Back then, Bruin Walk was dominated by a street preacher named Swami X who pontificated every day about global politics. During my time here, Murphy Hall was occupied by students protesting the Vietnam War and the bombing of Cambodia. And Iranian students would daily protest against the Shah of Iran, promoting an Islamic revolution. And of course, Coach Wooden almost kicked Bill Walton off the basketball team because he thought he was overdue for a haircut and a shave. Pretty wild time. I entered UCLA as an aspiring journalism student. I took every journalism class I could find here, and I spent hours in the offices of the Daily Bruin, which gave me access to learn the ropes of this big university and how it really worked, or at least how we figured, how we could figure out how it might have really worked. I came here thinking that maybe I wanted to be the next Walter Cronkite or Tom Brokaw, but like each of you here today, I decided to major in political science. It wasn't a radical lane change, but it was a new kind of direction. 
Looking back, my political science classes built the foundations for my worldview, my passions, my interests. It was that freshman seminar on electoral politics with William Gerberding, who became the chancellor of the University of Illinois shortly after, or a lecture course on American politics with a professor named Paul Halpern, who brought the great author, the late author David Halberstam here to campus, who had just written the best and the brightest about the Kennedy White House. And that unlocked Washington, D.C. for me. Richard Baum's course on Chinese politics, took a, which I took sort of on a bit of a whim, opened a deep interest in Asia and China that would lead me eventually to cut the ribbon on Jimaji, the Chinese version of Sesame Street in Shanghai just a little over a year ago. What I learned in the classroom here changed my life direction in unexpected ways. And so did this place. I don't mean just this campus. I mean this city. It taught me and it has taught you more than you may realize. I've traveled to a lot of places in the world, many countries, many regions, yet look where we are. Westwood sits in the epicenter of transitions, a changing California, one of the most diverse populations of any city in the world, a Pacific-facing economy of shifting imports and exports. You've spent four years inside a dynamic library, or laboratory, rather, of leading technical and content innovation. You've been surrounded by a film and television industry that is the global storyteller. Los Angeles is a microcosm of the forces at play as our globe shrinks and issues including energy, the environment, religion, ethnic rivalry, sprayed by a media fire hose of content today, profoundly shifts human behavior. This campus is at the confluence of all these different streams, and you've been swimming in it for four years, or I suppose in some cases five or six years? UCLA is in a corridor of connecting dots, and if you can bottle what you've learned about being on the campus and in this city, you've got a leg up on a lot of other graduates at other institutions of higher learning who are unexposed to this real 21st century world. UCLA gave me the guideposts I needed to go back, go from here to Sacramento, to DC, to New York, and now back to DC, and to try to build the bridges between media, politics, and global perspectives. And the most profound influence of all, in my view, was learning the power of storytelling. California's film and television industry is the global storyteller, as I said, the ultimate dream maker. This environment had a huge influence on my life. It fueled my belief that the media is and continues to be the most powerful teacher ever created. A critical way to make the world a better place or a force that can be used for ulterior motives. Think about the power of films like Hotel Rwanda or The Killing Fields or Schindler's List. And now think about the news reports from NPR reporters like Deb Amos, in, who is in Syria right now, bearing witness to the depths of what humanity can do to itself. And simple stories like the ones you find on Sesame Street help kids deal with bullying or taking care of their bodies or even processing the death of a relative or a loved one. There were projects we did about helping kids of members of the military who were deployed multiple times and who may have come back different or not come back at all. Those stories can change us individually and as a nation. Storytelling speaks to all of us, no matter who we are, how old we are, or what language we speak. Today's technology is changing the stories we tell and how we tell them. That's good, and that's also a challenge. We're living in a mobile world where globally there are now more cell phones than people. Where these technologies or appliances 
are getting faster, smaller, cheaper. We're living in a time when social media is redefining news and challenging the whole concept of objective sourcing. Now, I grew up in a world of one-way communication. The media sat up on a mountaintop with deciding which stories to tell and doled them out to the public. The news of the day was whatever could fit onto sheets of newsprint. Interactivity meant running the occasional letter to the editor or inviting someone to do an outside commentary. That was even true when I was at the Daily Bruin. And it's still somewhat true in traditional news operations. But the world we live in today is one where Twitter and Facebook and mobile devices have surfaced a multi-channel spider web of content. There is no mountaintop in social media. The power of our democracy has never been more visible or more vulnerable. Because how do you sort through all of it? How do we know what to trust? What is rumor and what is hard fact? Those of us who grew up in traditional news environments where news reports stayed on the printed page or in a box with an, 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 an antennae on it, aren't the same as you all who have grown up as digital natives, who understand maybe how one sniffs out fact from fiction, who's credible and who's not. I have a tough time with that. Some of you poli-sci majors may campaign for public office. You'll need to fight past an octopus of unabashedly opinionated journalists, and I have quote marks around that word, who don't play by the rules or have any respect for actually sourcing their reports. Some of you may go into law and find your client's cases tried and decided in the court of public opinion before you ever make it in front of a judge. And some of you may go into journalism and will need to be part of the reinvention of our profession. One of the ironies of our media culture today is that at a time when technology has offered us a bazillion news feeds and perspectives and reports from around the world, we've been forced to narrow our, our information streams to a realistic number. We can't take it all in, so we have to sort and filter and screen and focus our information sources down to a few specialized search terms. Years from now, when some of you push to pass a law or turn smart ideas into effective businesses or nonprofit organizations, you're going to be working with a public that may fail to engage on important issues that you are passionate about because they don't have the, that term in their Google alerts. As a society, that self-selection of news has larger implications. If we are the curators of our information streams, we find what we're looking for, but not much else. How can we be surprised? How can we keep our eyes opened? when we are only looking at what we've decided we should look at. The same way your life can be affected by that course you signed up for, not expecting much from, and that served as a pivot point for everything in your life that came after. The same thing can happen if you look outside your search terms. We try to do that at NPR every day. You'll stumble across a story that you didn't expect and wouldn't dream of searching for that might make you a different person. Kind of like that Chinese politics class I took in the political science department right here. If you're just looking at hashtags about ukuleles, pizza, and Sanskrit, that could happen, I guess, you'll never discover that story about a new water scheme in Israel or a musical movement in Brazil that could have inspired you to pursue a new direction in your life. So I urge you to think about these profound changes now with scholarship and with innovative ideas and use them to inspire the world. This vital connection needs your smarts, your passion, your ideas as newspapers stumble. As cable news in prime time becomes 
the equivalent of the Dodgers versus the Giants on television. And as Facebook and Twitter redefine how we communicate and the consumption of news content, I want to challenge you to reverse mentor us so we can tell the Los Angeles story, California's story, America's story, and the world's story. This is the world you are inheriting from us parents, grandparents, and alums, and it needs to be told. I trust and hope that class you didn't plan to take, but did, may have given you the inspiration, the hopes, the curiosity, the drive to take on more difficult challenges. Use your degree to connect people Use it to create more seismic activity, whether it is from the noise of cookie monsters crunching to promote healthy eating, or the launching of a new information service, or in a groundbreaking report on NPR that speaks truth to power. The quest is starting now. And I'll be watching hashtag UCLA class of 2012 to see how it all turns out. Thank you and so many congratulations again. And now, me hungry for cookie. Thank you.